All right, let's, uh, let's get started. I want to welcome you on behalf of Stanford Law School and the Center for Internet and Society. It's my great pleasure to introduce Kevin Polson. Uh, he's going to tell you about his new book, Kingpin, how one hacker took over the billion dollar cybercrime underground. Um, I've read it. I'm happy to say it, it, it's, it's really a fantastic book. I'm, I'm, I'm not the first person to say so. But uh, w one of the reasons I think it's such a great book is there is probably nobody more qualified in the world uh, to, to tell the story. Uh, Kevin, for those of you who don't know, is an award-winning journalist. He is the co-founder of the uh, Threat Level blog in Wired Magazine. And he, in the, his past, he's also been known to make a hacker to himself, drawing the unwarranted, un unwanted attention of the FBI, uh, among others, um, and even, if the, for those of you who remember, the television program Unsolved Mysteries. He never made it onto America's Most Wanted. I think he's still a little sore about that, but fortunately he's putting his talent to good use here. It's on full display in this book. And uh, without any further delay, I wanna introduce Kevin Polson. Okay. Uh, so I wanna thank the Center for Internet and Society for having me. Um, I, am, uh, I am a former hacker. Um, in, uh, my thing was hacking the telephone company. So in the late 80s and the early 90s, I was very into to telephone company systems and how they worked. Uh, what got me in the most trouble in the end was I used my access to cheat at radio station phone-in contests uh, to ensure I was the right numbered caller to, to win prizes. So I won a Porsche and some, some cash uh, and eventually uh, wound up doing some time behind that. Um, so I, my hacking career ended in 1991, and uh, when I got out of jail, I did some other stuff for a while and then became a, uh, a journalist. Um, and uh, I've been doing that for about 12 years now. I've covered a lot of computer hackers in that time. Um, and uh, uh, a lot of interesting hacks and interesting people. But the, the first hacker that I covered in detail that I thought I, I really need to write a book about this guy was this man, uh, Max Vision. Uh, so Max, uh, he kind of came out of nowhere in the computer security scene in the, uh, in the mid to late 1990s. Uh, nobody had heard of him before, but overnight he became a very well-respected computer security researcher. Um, he, uh, he was what they call a white hat hacker, which means he had a hacker mindset and he had hacker skills, but he applied them, uh, or so we thought, completely legally. So he would, do, uh, he would do computer security research, he would analyze malicious software that appeared on the internet and, and what, write research papers about it. He did um, uh, penetration testing. So if you had a company and you, uh, you thought that you might become a hacker victim, you could pay Max uh, around $100 an hour and he would try and hack your system for you and then when he succeeded and he, he boasted a 100% success rate, he would uh, tell you how he did it. So uh, to explain the white hat, uh, white hat concept, uh, a white hat is a law-abiding hacker. A black hat hacker is one who breaks the law uh, and does it uh, for malicious purposes like financial gain. Uh, so Max was a white hat. Albert Gonzalez, the TGX hacker, is a classic black hat. A gray hat hacker is somewhere in between. Uh, so uh, perhaps uh, doesn't always get permission to break into something but isn't, isn't super malicious. Uh, that is not Julian Assange in the middle. <coughs> that's, uh, that's me. <laughs> so Max's, Max's uh, hat started looking a little grayer uh, when uh, in 1998 he became very concerned about a computer security vulnerability in a widespread piece of software called Bind. Uh, this, is a, this is a name server software. Basically it does the lookup from a domain name like google.com to an internet IP address. Uh, and uh, because it was so critical, it's installed everywhere. The security hole would let anybody get control of this system remotely from anywhere in the world. Uh, he became convinced that people, uh, particularly the US government, weren't acting quickly enough to secure their systems against this hole. So his solution was he wrote a program that automatically broke into ultimately thousands of government computers uh, and fixed the security hole uh, without their permission. 
so that was, it was kind of a white hat thing to do. Uh, at the same time, he, uh, his program installed a little back door in all of these machines in case he wanted to get back in. I saw, um, actually saw, in, and it's in the book, an email that he wrote for, uh, to an administrator on one of the systems at, uh, I think it was Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. Uh, he got into a lot of national labs. Uh, where he wrote, th wrote the system administrator from his own account and said, hey, uh, I see you've detected me. Um, don't, don't judge me as a black hat. I'm, I'm one of the good guys. Yes, I have access to all these systems now, but before everybody had access to them. So I've actually made them safer. Uh, it's a simple matter of numbers. Um, he got caught for this. So at this point, he's squarely a black hat. Great photoshopping job here. Uh, he got caught. Uh, the FBI tried to turn him into an informant. Uh, they, they wanted him to wear a wire uh, and engage one of his hacker buddies in, a, in an incriminating conversation. Uh, Max refused, and that's when they wound up uh, prosecuting him for this intrusion. He was sent to FCI Taft, a privately run uh, prison in Central California, for an 18-month term. Um, so this was, this was the real turning point for him. Um, while he was in jail, he, he met more serious, like, white-collar career criminals, so fraud artists and the like. When he got out, he found that because of his conviction and because it was such a high-profile case, he could no longer get legitimate computer security work. He was in a halfway house in Oakland when he sent out an email to a computer security jobs list uh, basically saying, I'm, I'm in des desperate straits. They're going to send me back to jail if I'm not able to get a job. I used to make $100 an hour doing penetration testing. You can hire me for minimum wage. Um, I'll take anything at this point. Um, he's talking about going out um, and uh, standing, standing on the street corner looking for, for odd jobs uh, and being unable to find them. So he, he wound up getting minimum wage employment at this point, uh, helping assemble computers um, in Berkeley. Um, that, uh, that didn't sit well with him for long, and when he got out of the halfway house, uh, he, he wound up um, hooking up with a, uh, a fraudster that he met in jail, uh, who in, term, in, in turn introduced him to this man, uh, Christopher Aragon. So this is where things got serious for Max. Uh, Aragon was a career criminal. Uh, he, he had staged a series of bank robberies um, in Colorado in the early 80s, most of them botched. Uh, the last one, they, he and his partner actually got away with money and there was a high-speed chase and he was caught. Uh, so he went to jail for five years. He got, uh, Chris got out, uh, he, he uh, got into credit card fraud for a while, and then he got busted again in a, a big marijuana trafficking operation. Uh, at the time that he hooked up with Max, he'd actually been trying to go legit. Uh, he'd run a, uh, an equipment leasing firm in Orange County that was very successful during the dot-com boom, but when, uh, when the dot-com bubble collapsed, uh, his business did as well. So he was looking, uh, at the very time that Max was looking for anything, any way of making money, um, he was staying with friends, he had medical problems that he couldn't afford to have fixed. Uh, at that very moment, Chris Aragon was looking for a partner to, to get involved in crime with. So they, want, they, they formed a partnership. Uh, Chris used the last of his resources to get Max set up with uh, computer gear. Uh, he gave him a laptop computer uh, and other stuff. And he began flying up to San Francisco um, periodically and checking Max into a hotel. So this was key. Max had learned through his earlier experiences that uh, hacking from home was a bad idea. He got he got traced very, very easily with his Pentagon hack. Um, and he, he also had no place to live at this point. He was just staying with friends. So Chris would come up and they would, st they would, they would uh, check into a hotel, uh, typically in the financial district. Um, and they would look for a room high up uh, with a good view of the city. And then they would bring up a giant Wi-Fi antenna that Max would use to, uh, to hack onto networks. So they, they had to bring it up the fire stairs because they were afraid that it would attract attention <laughs> if they took it through the lobby. Um, and uh, I, spoke with, I spoke with Chris in particular, described this as a grueling experience, like taking, something like taking this thing 20 stories up, uh, up the fire stairs. And then they would set it up by the window and they would just kind of scan around and latch onto a network. 
So a lot of hacking has been done through Wi-Fi, um, using it to get onto a vulnerable network uh, from the inside. Max was primarily just interested in the bandwidth and the untraceability. So he could get onto any network that, off that offered decent bandwidth and that either had no security on the Wi-Fi or, was, um, uh, or had poor security and could be cracked. So this is where Max, the, the, new, the newly crowned black hat hacker, ran into his first obstacle. Because although he was a very, very good computer intruder, remember he had a 100% success rate uh, when he was doing penetration testing, he didn't know anything about how to be a successful computer criminal. He didn't know how to make money at it. Um, you, you kind of naturally assume when you're a black hat that if you ever decide, or excuse me, when you're a white hat, that if you ever decided to go bad, that your ability to crack any network you want is gonna, is gonna lead to big bucks. Um, but it turns out not to be that easy, not to be that obvious. So he started off by hacking, hacking into banks. Uh, he wrote a script that went to the FDIC's website and downloaded lists of um, small credit unions and banks. Um, he looked particularly for the small ones on the assumption that they would be vulnerable. And then uh, his script would automatically get their IP addresses um, from a central uh, government-run registry and then scan those IP addresses, oh, those internet IP address ranges for vulnerabilities and he'd hack into them. So he could leave this running and a little bell would go off every time he hacked a new bank. But once he got in, he, he couldn't figure out a way to get money out uh, or to get anything of value. So finally he Googled uh, the question of how to make money at cybercrime. <laughs> and that's when he discovered what uh, what is certainly the biggest development in cybercrime in the last 10 years, which is the Carter Forums. So if you go back to the start of when criminals first started making money with uh, credit card fraud in particular, um, in the late 90s, all of their, all the business they did with one another and all the information they shared and advice on how to do it, they did in uh, chat rooms, uh, particularly the underground, the kind of undergroundish techie chat rooms called IRC, uh, which is a very old technology, but that is still, that is still in use uh, by hardcore techies. Uh, so they would go on IRC, and if they had scored a few credit card numbers, maybe by dumpster diving at the local mall, uh, they'd go on IRC, and they would say, hey, I have five credit card numbers. Anybody want to swap it for a CompuServe password or whatever? Um, it was a very inefficient system. In uh, 2002, some Eastern European cyber criminals invented the Carter Forum to solve this. Eastern Europe became really the, the center of organized cyber crime at this point because you had a lot of people in uh, Russia and Ukraine with a lot of computer talent. Uh, some of them had graduated very good colleges, but they had no real path uh, to employment the way that you did in, say, Silicon Valley. So they, they gravitated to cyber crime, and they were very, very good. A whole much higher level than anybody was expecting at the time. Um, and uh, once they got into it, they invented the idea that there should, be a, uh, there should be a central website where people could come and it would be like an eBay for crime. So you would, uh, you would sign up at this site and uh, if you wanted to sell information, like stolen credit card numbers or identity data, social security numbers, uh, whatever. If you wanted to sell equipment, credit card counterfeiting gear, magnetic stripe encoding gear, um, uh, <clears throat> gear for printing uh, fake checks, magnetic, uh, magnetic ink cartridges for printing the numbers on the fake checks. All of this, you could, you could sell it on this one central website. You would submit a sample of what you had to sell and it would be reviewed by an approved reviewer. And if it passed muster, you'd be permitted to sell. Um, so a lot of commerce started taking place in these Carter forums, as they were called. Um, this, uh, this is a screenshot of the first one, which was called Carter Planet, which was set up primarily by Ukrainians. Um, and uh, it was a whole new thing. Another one followed shortly afterwards. It became even more successful, and it was, uh, it was primarily English-speaking, unlike uh, Carter Planet, and that one was called Shadow Crew. So Max discovered, uh, discovered these forums, and he saw that they had thousands of people who knew exactly how to make money off of computer crime. So he did the logical thing and he, uh, he hacked them. 
uh, it was the free Amex hack. He identified a particular vendor of uh, stolen credit card numbers um, and posing as that vendor, he basically spammed as many of these carders as he could and said, hey, I have too much Amex. I have uh, an excessive amount of, of American Express credit card numbers. Uh, so many that I can't even sell them, so I'm giving them away. So just click here and take as many as you need. If, uh, if somebody clicked there, as uh, dozens of these criminals did, they wound up getting an Internet Explorer vulnerability uh, <clears throat> that would uh, give Max control of their system. So this was uh, in one fell swoop. Max went from knowing nothing about cybercrime to having back doors on dozens of cyber criminals' machines where he could go in and he could read their email. And he could read their instant messengers. Uh, and he could uh, key, uh, install key loggers and see what they log into and what their passwords are. And most importantly, he could steal all of their stuff. Um, so now he doesn't have to break into banks. He can, he can steal from, uh, from the criminals who have already done it. So this, um, I'll try not to get too geeky here. But this, this, is what, uh, this is what the hackers were buying and selling at, at that time and to a great deal uh, still today. Whenever you hear about uh, a computer intruder or a fraudster being busted with uh, thousands or in some cases millions of credit card numbers, in most cases what, what they've actually been busted with are these, uh, is the data from the back of the credit card, uh, the magnetic stripe. Uh, so this is um, the, the same information that's on the face of your card, but it also includes something called a card verification value, which is printed nowhere on your card. There's a little three-digit number on the back of your card that, that you're sometimes asked for when you make an online transaction. That's a different number. This, by design, is not available to you as a user because the credit card companies don't want you to be able to get tricked into giving it away. So if you get a phishing email, for example, uh, that purports to be from your bank that says enter your credit card number here, we, we think your account has been hacked, uh, whatever the ruse is, you can't give up this card verification value. You don't know it. It's only on the magnetic stripe. Um, that, that, made, that made magnetic stripe data the, the most valuable thing in the underground. So uh, as a baseline, uh, it would be $8 for a single credit card, and it could go up to $20 for a gold card, $50 for like a high limit corporate card. And these were being stolen uh, in bulk and sold in bulk in the underground. The reason you need these if you're a card counterfeiter is because without the, the card verification value, you can't make a fake card that will work in real life. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the point of sale terminal will reject it. So what Max did with this data at first was he sold it to uh, Chris Aragon, the former bank robber. He would steal this information from, uh, from, from other hackers and fraudsters and he would uh, get it to Chris, who, who had to kind of go into high gear and start using it before the, uh, the criminals that Max had stolen it from used it themselves and maxed out the cards or got them flagged by the credit card companies. So this was a... Uh, this was a process, uh, Chris was able to learn how to do this just by reading the Carter forums. All the tutorials were up there. And it involved uh, starting with blank plastic that he, that he bought from one vendor, um, running it through a, a, an embosser and a tipper that, uh, that put the little foil on the raised numbers or letters. He had a couple of printers for the, uh, for the printing. You could download from these Carter forums, you could purchase uh, templates. Um, for hundreds of different types of, uh, of credit cards that you could use to make a very realistic uh, depiction of the pattern on the fronts of the cards. Um, and uh, he basically just started churning out extremely good, high-quality fake credit cards and uh, fake driver's licenses to go with them. To, uh, to make use of these, these are the, the, the many names of Chris Aragon, uh, this is just one sheet, there, there are many of these. Um, so to, to make use of this, he had a crew of, um, of cashers, uh, about a dozen at the peak, that he would uh, dole out the cards to, and they would go to 
uh, he, they would go to the local mall, uh, or in some cases, non-local malls. He would fly them around. Uh, they spent a lot of time in Vegas doing this. And they would basically hit the shops, and they would start buying high-end designer handbags and watches and other material that could be sold on eBay um, at a relatively high price and converted into cash. Uh, then he would give Max a cut of the cash to a prepaid debit card called Green Dot. So Max had a prepaid Green Dot card and, uh, in San Francisco, uh, and Chris could load up that card with more money um, from any, drug, any Walgreens in Orange County, uh, converting the cash that he was getting into, um, uh, into an electronic payment system that Max could use at his convenience. Uh, so this, this is how they did business for a while. Uh, eventually, um, they made enough money at this that uh, Max moved out of the, uh, uh, stopped staying at hotels and rented a permanent safe house uh, that he could go to any time that he wanted and he crashed there for anywhere for, from a couple nights to a week at a time, working, working all night usually. Um, and this would be uh, like a corporate apartment complex uh, that, uh, that he would rent with fake ID um, and, uh, and very little questions asked. So uh, at this point, he, he had a place of his own that he lived at that his probation officer knew about. Uh, if, his, uh, if his PO came by to interview him or whatever, everything looked completely clean. Uh, but uh, when they weren't looking, he was slipping off to a safe house and doing his hacking. <coughs> Excuse me. So this, this worked out uh, well for him for a while. Uh, Max continued to hack, uh, was, was still hacking other hackers. Um, and at one point, he blundered into um, one, of the, one of the big scams um, in the mid-2000s that uh, very few people outside the, uh, the crime community know about. Uh, this, uh, this was a vulnerability uh, that uh, basically undid everything that I told you earlier about these card verification values on the back of a credit card on the MagStripe. So I was telling you that you can't be tricked into giving up your, uh, your account number um, and then uh, having that be used to make uh, counterfeit cards or cards that could be used in an ATM. Um, it turned out that for ATM cash withdrawals, most banks, or at least half the banks, including Citibank, which was the, the most hard hit by this, they, uh, for, uh, for a long time, they weren't checking the secret code on, um, on ATM withdrawals or debit card purchases. It was this huge oversight. So if you, uh, if you got the account number for somebody's uh, Citibank MasterCard and you tried to use it to make purchases as a MasterCard, it wouldn't work. But if you got the account number for somebody's Citibank ATM card and you could get their PIN, you could make a card that would work at any ATM because the machines just weren't, tech, weren't checking the secret code. So uh, as a result of this, I, th there was this huge scam. Uh, it was mostly coordinated from Eastern Europe um, where uh, a, few, a, few, uh, a few criminals would mastermind uh, phishing emails like the one that you see up there um, and send it out and it would trick you into clicking on this fake Citibank link and entering your ATM card number and your PIN. Um, and uh, then uh, these Eastern Europeans would have mules in the U.S. that would, um, that would hit ATMs and just empty your bank account. So this, uh, Gartner did a study of this and found that uh, uh, the banks suffered $2.7 billion in losses in just one year in 2005 from this. Uh, and nobody heard of this. It was just, to most observers, it was this very puzzling phishing attack that, that didn't make any sense. Why are they asking for pins? They shouldn't be able to use it. So Max got into this by hacking, hacking one of the mules uh, working for an Eastern European. Uh, he was stealing the pins and stealing the, uh, the account numbers and then uh, going to banks and uh, going to ATMs and withdrawing cash. Eventually, he just contacted the Eastern European that this mule was working for and told him what he was doing. He said, I hacked your mule. I'm stealing your stuff. I've been getting away with it for months. Uh, I think you've, you've misplaced your trust in this guy. And so the Eastern European switched his business to Max and started just, just giving Max the, the, selling Max the numbers directly. And then Max would hit the ATMs and send a take back to Eastern Europe. And he made about a quarter of a million dollars doing this over the span of a few months. So uh, at this point, it was mostly all about hacking the hackers for Max. And then um, Operation Firewall happened. So Shadow Crew at this point was the only big remaining uh, Carter forum, the big uh, cybercrime super site. Um, it had 4,000 users. 
it was English speaking, but it also welcomed people from all around the world. Um, and um, the Secret Service took it down with the help of an informant who called himself Kumba Johnny. This turned out to be uh, Albert Gonzalez, who would go on while working as a Secret Service informant to stage some, some pretty serious computer attacks of his own. So this, um, this operation, Destroying Shadow Crew, was a major blow to the underground. Uh, as, the, as the last remaining one-stop shop crime site, when it went away, nobody really knew who to trust anymore. And uh, there was no one central place to go to to do their business. So that created problems for Max, and it created problems for a lot of, uh, a lot of other cyber criminals. Um, it took uh, roughly a year, but then new sites started up. But it was sort of a very fractured. There were a lot of them, and they had a much smaller number of users than Shadow Crew had had. Uh, Max himself uh, set up one at this point. After Operation Firewall, he didn't trust any of the other sites. He figured any of them could be run by Akumba Johnny. Any of them could turn into a secret service operation. So he set up a site called cartersmarket.com one year after Operation Firewall. And uh, he started, uh, <clears throat> he basically set up two identities for this. He had one where he called himself Iceman, who was the administrator of the site, and another who uh, he used named Digits or Generous, who, uh, who would sell stolen credit card data on the site. He thought by having two, uh, two identities that he could never actually be prosecuted or investigated for running the site because it was a free speech issue. Um, as long as he could, as long as nobody could prove that he was actually doing business on the site himself, he thought he was safe. So he did this in partnership with Chris Aragon, who uh, called himself Easy Living and Karma. If you haven't figured it out yet, by now Max is squarely on the black hat side. <clears throat> by this point, he ha in fact has stopped stealing from other, other cyber criminals, and he's developed his own primary sources of credit card data. Uh, what he's done is he discovered, uh, he, he was among the first to learn about a, a vulnerability uh, in a piece of remote administration software. It's the kind of thing that you would use to, uh, it's, like, it's kind of like gotomypc.com, except it's for commercial users and it's called uh, VNC. So this VNC vulnerability would basically allow you to create a skeleton key that would let you break into any system that was running VNC uh, without a password. So basically, Max scanned the entire internet looking for VNC vulnerabilities, and uh, that's how he discovered that restaurant point of sale terminals tend to run VNC. And they tended to have this, this security hole. So he wound up hacking uh, hundreds of point of sale terminals around the country, specifically targeting restaurants. Uh, these are, um, you, you've, see, you've probably seen these in restaurants. These are uh, very sophisticated all-in-one systems that do everything from uh, handle reservations for tables to taking orders and they handle the, the, the credit, card, uh, credit card swipe. So when you pay and you, the, the, uh, the waiter or waitress uh, slides your card to the system, it goes onto this machine and then it's stored at a server in the back room and Max was breaking into those servers and he was stealing credit card dumps and then selling them online. Um, so at this point, he was getting so many they couldn't just deal with Chris, which is why he needed, uh, needed this other identity. Um, he wound up getting millions of credit card numbers this way, or millions of dumps. Then, uh, then he moved on um, to, uh, uh, to another attack. Uh, this one, uh, there was a, yet another vulnerability in Internet, Ex Internet Explorer that came out. Um, Max had it when it was a zero day, meaning no, 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 none of the white hats, none of the good guys had it. Uh, and he worked with a partner, um, a different partner, um, to pick targets to go after with this. He told his partner, uh, I, have, I have a log of, of part of the chat, he, he told his partner, assume we have a free pass today to own whatever company we want, uh, because we can, we can hit anybody. So his partner came up with a list of targets. So it was Bank of America, GMAC, City Mortgage, Capital One. Uh, any place that uh, his partner thought might have money that they could steal. So Max uh, staged what, uh, what's called a spear phishing attack. Uh, this, is, uh, this is like a spam-based attack, except it's focused. Uh, <clears throat> in this case, he posed as a reporter for a, uh, 
publication called Lending News, who's working on a story about a hack at your company, uh, Capital One. So he'd send an email sa uh, saying, um, I saw your name in this other, in, uh, I saw your name in a report about this breach at your, at your company. I'm doing a follow-up story. Could you give me a call? And then included a link to that story. Um, and if the person clicked on it, their computer would be owned. So at Capital One, uh, 500 of these spam emails got through. Uh, and uh, one out of four of uh, the recipients of Capital One clicked on this link uh, and opened their machine up to Max. So he would come in and he had a com the complete run of Capital One's network. Same thing happened at, uh, at Citibank. Uh, the problem with Max was he's easily distracted. So he had access to all of these sizable financial institutions networks. Uh, when he became concerned about the state of the computer underground, uh, for one thing, people weren't showing him proper respect as Iceman, the leader of Carter's market. Uh, the system was also fundamentally flawed, he felt, because unlike Shadow Crew, where there had been one big site with 4,000 criminals buying, selling, and trading, there were now at least five important sites, all of which had anywhere from a couple hundred to 2,000 users on them. So his idea, Instead of uh, playing around in Capital One's network, he thought it would be more important to unify the computer underground. So he used various vulnerabilities uh, and plotted out his attack over the course of a couple weeks. He had some whiteboards in his safe house where he sketched everything out. He was reading Sun Tzu's The Art of War for guidance. He wound up uh, uh, executing his attack over 48 hours, mostly sleepness, sleepless, um, and he absorbed um, all of these other crime sites into his site. He broke in, he sucked down their databases of users, he sucked down all of their posts, all of the, the information, the price lists, the vending, whatever. Um, and then uh, as he left, he destroyed the databases of the competing sites so they couldn't come back up. Then he sent out an email to all of these, all of these computer criminals, 6,000 now, saying, uh, congratulations, you are now a member of Carter's Market. Don't bother returning to the old site, it's gone. This, this was big enough, uh, this created enough of a stir that, that USA Today wrote an article, uh, they quoted an expert as saying, it's like he created the Walmart of the underground. Uh, Max promptly put that on the Carter's Market uh, blogging page. So he was, he was proud of this, um, as, as he should have been. So one of the sites uh, actually managed to come back up. And this was uh, darkmarket.com. Dark Market had, uh, uh, it was run by uh, an, a, um, uh, an English hacker, uh, a UK hacker named Jilsey. Uh, it had a couple heavy, heavy hitters from Turkey on it and a, a mysterious Eastern European spam king who called himself Master Splinter. So Master Splinter had been around for about a year. He was so notorious in the underground um, that he actually had an entry on um, uh, spam houses, registry of known spam operations. So this is kind of like a most wanted list for spammers, um, where he was described as running a loosely organized spam and scam crew from Eastern Europe. He's, he's linked to proxy spam, pump and dump, JavaScript exploits, Carter forums, botnets. He's got his fingers in everything. Uh, he's uh, he, he's uh, believed to be in Poland. So this is one of the victims of the dark market hack. Master Splinter turned out to be J. Keith Mularski. He's not in Poland, he's in Pittsburgh. Uh, he, he, works, uh, he works in an FBI office, uh, and he's been underground just kind of lurking for a year. He got, he persuaded uh, Spam House, the anti-spam organization, to run a fake profile of him in order to, to convince uh, criminals that he was for real. Um, but aside from that, he'd mostly been lurking at this point. But when Dark Market was hacked, he, uh, he saw an opportunity and he persuaded Jilsey, the guy who ran Dark Market, to turn over the server to him, Master Splinter. His pitch was, look, this guy Iceman's hacking you left and right. I'm a spammer. I know how to run servers that can withstand attacks. Give me control of the system. Um, I'll, I'll be happy to help. So this became a, an ambitious, long-running FBI undercover operation where uh, uh, Master Splinter, Keith Mularski, got the site back up, 
using government funds. He managed to he put it on some very, very uh, uh, robust servers that could not only withstand DDoS attacks, but if Max, if Max destroyed the tables again, they would have daily backups that they could restore from. Uh, so it became a kind of a cat and mouse game that went on for a year where you had uh, Max Vision, the former white hat hacker turned bad, um, trying to destroy Dark Market. He's very upset that it came back to life. Um, and you had Master, Master Splinter trying to figure out who this Iceman guy was. So you had, uh, uh, the feds had informants, uh, some of whom kind of got close to Max. Uh, they used technical measures. Uh, they tried to trace him. There was some physical surveillance near the end. Max, in the meantime, was hacking into dark market. And at one point, he actually d identified the fact that uh, Keith, that, that Master Splinter was logging in, not from Poland, but from an Eastern Europe, but, but from a, uh, uh, but from an FBI office in Pittsburgh. And he tried to warn the underground, he tried to warn people on dark market and Carter's market, hey, Master Splinter's a Fed. But um, uh, that didn't work out because all of these criminals remembered that Max had hacked all of the forums and taken them over. And uh, they believe that this was just a ruse that he was inventing uh, in order to, to further damage the dark market. So eventually, uh, eventually dark market uh, netted the FBI 30 arrests around the country. Uh, they got Chilsey, they got a, a German kid that, that ran the site and was heavily into, into fraud. Uh, that's Matrix. Uh, they got, uh, uh, in Turkey, they got Chow, who was the first, uh, the first hacker to actually stage a kidnapping. He had kidnapped a suspected informant and stripped him down to his underwear and <clears throat> uh, uh, sat him on a chair, took his picture holding a sign saying, I'm a rat, and then he posted that on Dark Market. Uh, so he's in prison now. Um, and it turned, it, turned into a, it turned into a very, uh, very successful undercover operation. Um, so the whole time Max was trying to expose Master Splinter, uh, in the end, Max kind of lost his Carter War. Uh, I won't, won't say exactly how it happened because that's the final chapters of the book, which you should all read. Um, uh, they found that there were 1.1 um, million cards that he had compromised from point of sale terminals. He'd stolen another 700,000 from other criminals in, uh, in his Robin Hood days as a hacker. Uh, they added up the charges on the cards he stole from point of sale terminals, and they came to $86.4 million. That's not the money that he made personally. He was selling the, he was selling the card data. Uh, that was the money that was put on the cards in the end by whoever bought the data. Um, and he's, uh, uh, he was sentenced to 13 years, which was, uh, at the time, lo the longest hacking sentence in history. Um, so he's getting out in 2019. Now... Uh, if anybody has any questions, I'll answer them. Ah, the book cover. Um, yeah. So uh, there, there have been um, there have been hackers that that make uh, make a windfall, and they use it on they use the money on cocaine and parties. Um, uh, and that sort of thing. Uh, Chris Aragon, uh, his partner in Orange County, um, uh, took a took a mistress and set a set up a little house for her, and was going to Vegas a couple times a month and partying with the the, the women in his crew and and uh, ordering uh, five hundred dollar bottles of wine. Uh, Max bought a Sony Ibo robotic dog. Uh, and he gave a lot of money to, uh, to the homeless and it tipped cab drivers excessively. Um, so in the end, uh, I, he made a fair amount of money, prob probably around a million dollars, um, but uh, he just kind, of, um, just kind of pissed it away um, on random stuff. Um, he wasn't, uh, uh, and he wasn't seemingly having a lot of fun, or at least not the same kind of fun that, uh, that, that his buddy in Los Angeles had. Um, his friend, um, uh, his partner, Chris Aragon, by the way, also got busted um, and was one of the people that ultimately informed on Max. He, uh, he got busted uh, buying purses at a Bloomingdale's. It, uh, 
for some reason, for some reason, I thought it was suspicious. <laughs> and uh, he, uh, he, his case is still pending. He's in an Orange County, uh, uh, County, Orange County jail now, and uh, he's looking at a three strikes case. Uh, so he's been fighting this case aggressively since his arrest in 2007. Um, if he goes to trial and loses because it's a three strikes case, he had remember those that bank robbery conviction. He had the, uh, the drug trafficking conviction. If he loses uh, a trial, he's facing a mandatory 25 to life. Uh, it's actually kind of sad. He has, uh, he has two kids and a third by his mistress. Um, and uh, uh, he's looking at, at basically spending the rest of his life in prison for this. Yeah, I think I think Stuxnet is really amazing. It's 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 the most sophisticated piece of malware that's ever been found, and I'm interested in part because it appears to be something that slipped out. It's basically a secret government project. Everybody knows that it was created by a government, or maybe two, right? Um, that uh, that 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 is now accessible and can be reverse engineered by people. And a lot of people have spent a lot of time just p probing the innards of this thing. And for those who don't know, Stuxnet is a virus that, uh, uh, it was detected in the wild, but when, uh, when the experts started going into it, it turned out not to be just a run-of-the-mill Windows virus. It had five zero-day vulnerabilities, which means it used five, five, at, five at Windows attacks to spread that had never been seen before. They were completely unknown in the computer security community. Um, and then once it got into a system, it checked for the existence of a particular piece of industrial control software. And then if it found it, it checked to see if that control software was controlling centrifuges in a certain configuration. And then if it was, it would start interfering with the speed of the centrifuges. And uh, eventually, after months of analysis, the experts figured out that the configuration it was looking for was a uranium enrichment uh, facility in Iran. So basically, somebody put out this virus for the sole purpose of letting it circulate, doing no damage until it got into this, uh, this one facility in Iran where it would start destroying centrifuges. And uh, uh, there's actually some evidence now that Iran had to replace a bunch of their centrifuges at this facility. And uh, the virus is still out there mucking things up, um, just for them, nobody else. So it's uh, the the the, the suspicion is that it was done by, uh, by Israel, um, uh, possibly with help from the U.S. I, ha I hadn't heard that. I, I know there was there was a, a covert operation where the West gave what they thought were fake uh, uranium enrichment uh, technologies to Iran using a double agent. Yeah, I mean. I mean, just the fact, I mean, it's like, it's like a glimpse of malicious software from the future. It's like a virus from the future. <laughs> um, it's, so, it's so above and beyond anything that had been seen in the wild before. Clearly, I mean, yeah, I mean, they, I, they, they've been working with mainstream journalists now. Um, so I, there was a time where they could be accused of being uh, reckless, uh, not, uh, not, not showing any kind of journalistic judgment with what they produced. But with their most recent leaks, they've been, uh, they've been much, more, much more conservative, and they've, they've clearly performed a, a journalistic function. You mean after he was arrested? 
He's lobbying for that now. He actually wrote, uh, he wrote a, a whole report for them on the things that he might do for them if they were to just give him the chance called Why the U.S. Needs Max. And so he proposes hacking, hacking Al-Qaeda for them, that sort of thing. I, I think uh, part, part of the problem is um, he, first he's been a white hat and he committed crimes while, while he was a, a, a very well respected white hat. So that, that undermines credibility. But more than that, I think the government at this point is, is home growing their own computer intrusion talent. Uh, I think there, there are a lot of smart people in the government. Um, so they don't have the need that maybe they once would have to, to resort to, to convicted computer hackers. I mean, we know Israel has some, some good people. <laughs> Not yet. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, so, so what is it that you detected? Well, so sometimes they do. Like they, 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 they have been busts. But the, ha the hackers tend to be ahead. They tend to have the advantage over the feds on the technology front. I, like what Max was doing. I mean, he was hacking through, through Wi-Fi. You can't really trace that. I mean, not, not realistically. And then on top of that, that was just his first step. He would go out onto somebody's hacked Wi-Fi, and they would go through proxy servers, which could be anywhere in the world. Then it would bounce through, uh, through a botnet, so any random, random PC user could wind up uh, channeling his internet activity. Um, so there's almost, uh, electronically, there's, there's almost no way to, to get back at him. Um, exactly. Who said that? Right, that's, that's where they've had a lot more success because the, the, the computer intruders, I mean, in the, in the end, if they're going to make money out of it, they, they've got to get it to cash somehow. Um, so uh, uh, the, uh, a, a, most of the commerce uh, in the underground took place over um, eGold, which is a PayPal-like system backed by gold, um, and that did nothing to verify the identities of, uh, of its users. Um, and there were services that you could use where you could link an eGold account to a, uh, a bank card, for example. So you get an anonymous uh, ATM card linked to your eGold account, and you could walk to any ATM and convert it to cash. So there's a money trail. Somebody like Max would have several eGold accounts. People have bought his, his stolen data would transfer money into his eGold account, but then that's linked to a card that Max can, pull, can use to pull cash out anywhere, and there's, there's once again, no way to, to get your hands on it. So they've, they've, they've developed ways to, to kind of stay ahead of things. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> that's a good guess. Yeah, there's, well, there, there, uh, there was just recently a slew of uh, um, uh, malicious, like, backdoored software uh, that uh, that was detected being offered for the uh, 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 for Android phones, um, and that just got banned from Google. Um, now, as, as we do more and more work on on smartphones, they're going to start getting the same kind of uh, malware attacks that we've been getting on our Windows PCs for years. So that's that's one that's one part of the future. Uh, there, right now, um, in addition to the trade in dumps and the stolen credit card data. There are a lot of attacks uh, targeting small business owners' bank accounts. They're online banking. So the hackers will, uh, will penetrate your PC if you're a small business owner and install software that uh, grabs your online banking credentials when you log in to manage your account. Um, and then, uh, uh, then the hacker will go through your own machine out to your online banking 
log into your account, affect a money transfer to some innocent dupe who thinks he's, he has a new work at home job that involves getting money from random people and sending it to Eastern Europe. <laughs> and then they'll use the software to rewrite your, um, uh, your credit state, your, um, uh, your transaction records on the fly so that when you check your account balance, it looks like everything's okay. So this is, this is something that's it's hitting uh, very hard right now and uh, some companies have gone out of business as a result of this because unlike credit card fraud, the uh, 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 businesses are on the hook when they're hit with bank fraud like this. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it is, yeah, it's not, it's not getting better. It's not a growth industry though. Uh, the, uh, the trade in, in dumps in credit card data uh, was uh, much bigger than conventional identity theft. And now uh, this, uh, uh, these, bank these bank account hacks are the big thing. So you still have people doing uh, identity theft, which means taking over somebody's identity and opening new lines of credit in their name. But uh, there's so many ways to get caught at that uh, and it's such a hassle uh, that, that it's really not a growth industry. The, uh, uh, the FBI and uh, a, 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 a journalist I respect, Brian Krebs, uh, who used to be at the Washington Post, they've, uh, they've both recommended that you just not use your main computer for online banking. You have a separate computer that you use for nothing else except your online banking. So you can never click on a bad link and pick up malicious software. You can never, never get, uh, get an email that tricks you into, into loading something you shouldn't. The machine is used for this and nothing else, and that's the only way to stay safe. Me? No. Oh, I don't. My credit card's been stolen so many times. <laughs> I don't. I, I don't. I don't know if Max, if Max, is, Max has ever done it, but Albert Gonzalez got me twice. Uh, yes, sir. What should the government do? I, I'm not sure if the government has a solution here. Um, they, they're getting hacked too. Uh, I mean, they're, they're not at the point where, they're, where they can secure government systems. Uh, it's a different type of hacking. They're, they're getting it from... Uh, I see what you're saying. Um, I, uh, the, the fraud problem that I've been talking about, it, it, has, it has to do a lot with um, uh, companies uh, not prioritizing cybersecurity and financial institutions accepting a certain amount of fraud as being acceptable. Like um, the, the magnetic stripe on the, on the back of the credit card, that doesn't have to be there. Uh, in, the, in pretty much the rest of the world, they've introduced a technology called chip and pin, uh, that where there's an encrypted handshake between a microprocessor on your card and the bank's computer, and that that makes the kind of uh, kind of wholesale uh, theft and, and selling of credit card data that I've been describing that it makes that obsolete. It makes it pretty much impossible. Uh, they haven't implemented that in the U.S. because it would just cost too much. So they're saying we would rather have millions, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of fraud every year and just absorb that and deal with that than, uh, than fix it. Yeah. Um, they're, they're, but of course, the, if, the, if a consumer gets hit, consumers, uh, uh, while not financially liable, they have to deal with a hassle. They, have to, they, they may find themselves without a card as a new one is shipped out to them. If they miss fraudulent charges, then uh, they'll wind up paying for them unwittingly. So. They, uh, they, they are vulnerable, they can be hacked. Uh, they aren't targeted as, as much because they're not uh, plentiful the way Windows computers are. So the hackers focus on, 
the low-hanging fruit, so they've been targeting Windows machines. Maybe that could change as, as the Mac gets more and more market share. You know, I, 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 would, I, I think it would be the same thing where the, uh, the intruders tend to target um, devices and systems that they could get on a mass scale. Um, so this would be kind of a custom application that I don't, I don't imagine would be targeted. Um, probably, probably well after a Mac. Uh, yes, sir. Square up. Oh, <laughs> I'm, I'm interested in that. I don't, I don't, have, I don't have an answer to that. I, we're seeing I, point of sale systems are, are proving vulnerable, so it's just a question of whether this one, this one has been tested. Uh, there are um, actually industry standards that are, that are promulgated and enforced by Visa that's supposed to apply to everybody that handles MagStripe data um, and some of the, uh, uh, some of the, the major retailers and, and small restaurants that have been hacked were actually found to be compliant at the time that they were they were being hacked. So those standards haven't really proven effective so far. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> That's a broad question. Yeah, I see. Um, describe some social engineering attacks. Good one. Yeah. What he said. Now you know that one. I, 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 is there is there anything specific that you're thinking of? Yeah, I, um, I social engineering what ha, is a role in um, in a lot of attacks, particularly on the um, okay Facebook, for example, is being used increasingly increasingly as an attack vector. And what you'll see is a fraudster will hack into somebody's Facebook account and send a, and, and post a message or send messages to everybody uh, who's friends with that person on Facebook, posing as the friend, and say, um, hey, I've, I'm traveling overseas, my wallet has been stolen, I have no money, I, my passport's gone, I need help, can you send, send, send me some money Western Union? And then I'll give, a, uh, give a, an address to the local Western Union office in Belarus or whatever. Um, and that a surprising, a surprisingly large amount of people are falling for this. And part of, par, part of it is because once, you've, once a hacker has hacked his Facebook account, he could see, see messages going back and forth, or he could see what, uh, what the person's friends have posted to the wall. So when you get a message like this, it won't just appear to come from your friend. It'll actually, actually be written in the, the style in which your friend writes and may, might reference the time you had dinner with your friend a month ago. Uh, so, hey, wasn't that pizza restaurant great? Oh, by the way, I'm stuck in Belarus. I need money. <laughs> And so people fall for it, and it's a numbers game. You send out enough of these, and, uh, and the percentage of respondents may be small, but uh, it's not like it's costing you a lot to do it. Uh, yeah. Uh, they really aren't. I, there, there, have been, there have been some theoretical attacks uh, that, that undermine components of it, um, but, uh, but so far, um, everyone that I've seen uh, where chip and pin has been compromised has been because um, uh, the system still supports MagStripe data as well, which is mostly done for the benefit of Americans who are traveling overseas. So if, if MagStripes were eliminated worldwide, uh, we wouldn't see that. This is, this is if you're a consumer and your bank account is hacked?
If you, if you, I think you have 60 days to notify them. Yeah, if they if they detect it, they'll they'll act quickly because they don't. It could escalate, uh, right? If it may, you may have a twenty dollar fraudulent charge this month, but if uh, if they if they know about it and they let it go, maybe it'll be three thousand dollars next month, and you will notice that, and the bank will wind up paying it. So, they are they've actually gotten very good about about detecting fraud rapidly. They, yeah, they'll, they, they send you a form to fill out, like an affidavit uh, swearing that you weren't responsible for the charges. And then once you fill that out, they'll, they'll cover you. Yeah. you. You only have to be proactive uh, in, in cases where the bank might not detect it and you might not detect it. So there, are, there have been some fraud schemes where instead of doing these big cash outs like Max and Chris Aragon were doing, um, a, a fraudulent company will arrange to bill you some small amount repeatedly and they'll do this by you know, thousands, hundreds of thousands of people. They'll bill you like 1995 a month. Yeah, so that they can get away with a long time. And that, that you want to look out for because your bank, uh, bank probably won't detect that. And if you don't detect it, you'll wind up paying, paying a lot of money before you, before, before you catch on. So I don't know. I think, I think you can be on the hook for those charges after a certain period of time. Though I think uh, a bank will... Uh, a lot of banks will cover you anyway, even if they're not technically required to. <laughs> he he saw his behavior as consistent. Like when he was when he was ripping off hackers, when he was hacking them and stealing their stuff. He was kind of like Omar Little in the wire. So he had, he had his own code. Um, then when he um, stopped hacking them, started dealing with them legitimately as Iceman or, or as Digits, the, the credit card vendor Digits, he, uh, he, he believed his obligations had changed. He was no longer preying on them. He was part of the community. And he wanted to, he wanted to practice the kind of square, square dealing that he did in real life. So it was just a matter of context. Like he. Uh, he when he was when he was a, uh, when he was praying on the underground, he believed that what he was doing was legitimate. When he was uh, working with them, he wanted to he wanted to be honest about that as well. If that makes sense, <laughs> read the book a second time; it'll make more sense. Um, I, I like that idea. I think a spam filter is going to catch most of this already. So it may not offer, like checking the links might not offer that much of an incremental advantage. But you know, Google, Google does this now with search results. Right, like a, a spear phishing attack. Yeah. I wouldn't think so. I don't know. It may already exist for all I know. I, I haven't heard of it. Maybe some Stanford student will uh, <laughs> invent it and get rich. Yeah. Microsoft suggested that? <laughs> Uh, they have experience with malware. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That's tricky. And I mean, one one problem is there. Uh, the more the, the threat always evolves to to meet any new any anything anything that's set up to counter it. I, if if uh, you know, c computer shooters, they have uh, in a lot of cases they are the first now to find vulnerabilities. And they can write software that isn't going to be detected by any current antivirus software. Um, 
So you might, something like that might catch, so might catch a lot of the low hanging fruit, uh, like the cheaper scams, uh, but uh, not the sophisticated ones. And it sounds like something would actually create a lot of problems for the end user in the, in the course of things. So not knowing anything at all about, what, <laughs> about this proposal, it does, it does not offhand sound like, like a good move. Anybody else? And yes. <laughs> I knew I should have picked that guy. <laughs> <clears throat> I I think you have to. Um, the, mo the most important thing is probably, and it's not terribly sexy, but it, uh, to keep your, uh, keep your software up to date with the latest patches. Um, uh, and, and not just your, your operating system. If you're running Windows, you should, have, you should probably have auto update turned on. Um, you, but you also have to worry about um, uh, uh, your, your Adobe plugins and um, uh, your, your instant messenger client, like basically any piece of software that in any way interacts with the internet. Uh, you have to make sure you have the absolute latest version at all times. And a lot of the, a lot of the software has auto-update features. There, there's also uh, some utilities you could install that'll keep you up to date on what software you have that isn't up to date uh, so that you know know what, uh, what isn't current. And the reason is because every, as soon as a vulnerability is discovered, if the Black Hats didn't have it before, they'll have it once, once it gets fixed. Because they can go into the patch and they can reverse engineer it and figure out what what's being fixed, and then they can write an exploit to take advantage of it. So uh, keeping your software up to date, you know, run a firewall, run antivirus software, blah, 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 all the usual stuff. Uh, check your, check your credit, credit card statements, um, and uh, uh, possibly check your credit reports periodically just to make sure you're not a victim of identity theft. Okay, I'm going to take one more question because I hated that one. No offense. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, well, you sit next to her, but all right, go ahead. <laughs> I, I, I think following Max's arrest, Albert Gonzalez was busted, and he was doing the same thing Max was doing, but at major retailers. Uh, and he got 20 years in prison. Um, the guy that he was dealing with in... Um, uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, the one who bought and sold his data, uh, he was one of Max's targets in his Robin Hood days, Maxic. Um, he was sentenced in Turkey uh, to 30 years. So what's next is uh, 40 years. <laughs> um, well, thanks for having me again. Uh, thank you.